Welcome back to The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky the Third. Last time we made some headway into the Luminous Labyrinth, we in fact found two uh, war points in there, as well as got a lot of chests, but we have not quite found the Ceiling Stone in there just yet, because I'm saving that for its own part. You might notice that I have Teeter in the party now, because this time we're going to be going to Star Door 7. The interesting thing about the doors right now is you might notice that we've completed most of the sun and moon doors right now. There's only uh, two more sun doors left to find, one more moon door. But there are still quite a lot of star doors left in the game. From now on, like, I feel like the doors are a little bit front-loaded, or at least middle-loaded. From now on, the game's gonna be a bit lighter on doors. They'll still be there, but most of them will be relatively short. And this one is a very short door. Uh, this one is actually less, like, in terms of character, uh, dialogue, or stories, and more just world-building and lore. But I know that a lot of people who play Trails find that really interesting, so we're gonna be going into this. However, this one does require a trial. I'm not gonna be using the voice patch for this because there's really nothing to voice here apart from the doors themselves. I still wonder who the voice of the doors is supposed to be, since it sounds male, so it's clearly not the ghost. And it's definitely not the Lord of Phantasm, because I've heard them voiced and it definitely doesn't sound like them. Anyway... It almost looks like it's snowing in the background there. Man, this piece of music will not last. Overcome the trial before you, then I shall grant you a, to you a memory fragment and my blessing. So, uh, our main threat here is not so much this Star Guardian right here, but these mischiefs. They have a lot of health and they can petrify you, so I've equipped anti-petrify accessories on everyone, except Tita. The thing about Tita is, and this is something that again comments pointed out to me that I didn't realise before, Tita works uniquely when it comes to, okay I won't get this buff off until she goes into Orbal Gear, Tita works uniquely when it comes to accessories. When she goes into Orbal Gear mode, she actually loses the effects of all her quartz and accessories, other than their stat bonuses. So I've only given her the Fool's Emblem and Tiger Heart. Uh, and Estelle's gonna go and start casting Zodiac. And Tita's gonna summon the Orbal Gear. So the Orbal Gear has its own set of status immunities. And I really hope that includes petrification. It really should. Yeah, it probably includes petrification, because that resist there was almost certainly petrification. Now, these Mischiefs also have the same drops, I believe, as the Poltergeist. So if you want to equip the Luck Quartz on somebody, that's also great. Uh, the problem with that is that if Tita equips that, and she's going to be doing the majority of the killing here, uh, she will not, you know, get its effects, which is a problem. So I'm just going to go ahead and have you spam Death Scream while you can. Good thing that doesn't cancel. But yeah, this, tool, like, this trial can be a pain. Because there are a lot of these things. At first I was thinking, oh, I really shouldn't have um, used Josette's remote ability. But again, like, if these things um, have them dropped, it's going to be useful. So, smoke missiles. Uh, smoke missiles is great against these guys. I actually think, though, that range increases do affect the Orbal Gear. I seem to remember that having a bigger area if I used range increasing um, accessories. I could be wrong about that, but I, I, I mean... That's technically a stat, so I suppose it wouldn't be too far-fetched to assume that works. But okay, now that Tita has been buffed in Orbal Gear mode, and a lot of these things have been blinded, this should be easier. Oh yeah, I also have access to Chloe Sanctus Nova, um, if I can. I've got to remember that, because it's incredibly good. And these things are not immune to instant death, so Death Scream is great there. And Tita is going again, so she can do uh, more smoke missiles. I, I, can't, I can't quite hit that one. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and blind all of them. Just to be absolutely sure that we're not going to get pet- Well, I mean, we're definitely not going to get petrified because we're all immune to it. But, uh, again, blinding these things is great. This fight can be a little bit problematic if you don't know that these things can be blinded. This should probably wipe the field, though. I always found this S-Craft kind of interesting because 
Chloe never struck me as a particularly religious character. Uh, and yet her uh, ultimate attacking thing involves praying to Adios. Okay, didn't kill everything. I also have to remember that... Uh, oh, they can divide too. And the divisions don't seem to be blinded. Uh, but I also have to remember that... Um, That thing's gonna get on low HP and start doing its like full hitting attacks. I'm gonna airsprake with you just to make sure. I don't know how much this is gonna do. Uh, Estelle can take this. Okay, yeah, they're all down. So let's finish you with Wheel of Time. And there we go, that's the trial down. If you stumble onto that trial without realizing that these things petrify you, and you probably will since there's no real indication of that, you are probably gonna get slaughtered. Like, that's a, that's a tr door trial that wrecked me when I first attempted it. Ah, oh, nothing good, just this tier all bombs. You have overcome the trial. Thus I shall grant to you a memory fragment and my blessing. Again, I just wonder who this is exactly. Orbments are devices that use the orbital energy contained within Septium to cause a variety of useful effects. It has only been a little over half a century since they were first invented. But even in such a short time, they have revolutionised the world as we know it. From daily necessities such as lighting and heating, to tanks and other similar weapons used to defend our nations, orbments are used in just about every facet of our lives. In fact, it's now hard to imagine life without them. So much of what we take for granted in life now involves them in some way. And it is to proliferate and advance the development of these orbments that we exist. We, the Epstein Foundation. I believe it's pronounced Epstein because that's how it's said in the... That's how the Japanese katakana are. It's probably said in voice acting in Cold Steel at some point though, and it might have been Epstein, so I... Yeah, I could be getting that wrong, but I'll be calling it Epstein here. Our foundation was first established in the year 1155 of the Septian calendar, the year after Professor Epstein's passing, and was created by his brilliant-minded disciples in order to honour his wishes. The foundation is based in his home state of Lehman, where it remains in operation to this day. That's the same state that the Bracer Training Grounds is. It was rather limited in size in the beginning, and its attempt to spread orbital technology was initially met with little success. Maybe were initially met with little success? But anyway. Uh, sensing that the professor's dream would never be realised at the rate they were going, three key researchers left Lehman to try and spread the seeds of orbital technology across the continent themselves. One of these was Professor G. Schmidt. The professor, who had gained a fine reputation of his own for his skill in the field of mechanical engineering, went around and visited corporations in various nations to persuade them of the benefits of ordnance. The second was Professor L. Hamilton. Mindful of the technological gap between regions, she long believed it was rural and remote areas that needed augment technology more than any other. As such, she enlisted the help of the Bracer Guild, which already had a close relationship with the Foundation, and formed a mission with the intent of promoting and spreading the technology where applicable. The Professor herself also two of the regions with the aim of spreading public awareness and laying foundations for others to build on in the future. The third was Professor A. Russell, now known far and wide as the father of the Orbital Revolution. Professor Russell returned to his home nation of Le Burl and continued to work tirelessly to advance Orbment technology there. And within a year of returning, he had set up the Zeiss Engineering Factory, now known as the Zeiss Central Factory slash ZCF, and created the first orbment to be made outside Lehman States. That's why Le Burl was a little bit more ahead of its neighbours technologically, which was why Erebonia tried to invade it. Three years later, the reigning king of Le Burl at the time, Edgar III, visited the factory to inspect it, and he decided to donate a large amount of money to further its research. With his majesty's endorsement, orbments began to spread like wildfire throughout the kingdom, 
bring such prosperity that the people of other nations were filled with envy. Yes, as I said, that's why Erebonia invaded. Up until then, most people didn't see Orbmuts in a particularly positive light, but their success in Laburl changed those impressions virtually overnight. One nation after another began to reach out to our foundation to share Orbmut technology, and both our foundation's financial and social standing became that much more secure. In the eyes of the world, the Orbal Revolution was a sudden, far-reaching transformation. But it was only because of years of reaching out to people in diligent, largely unnoticed research that it was able to happen at all. Yeah, apart from this thing saying, like, orbment in singular when it should be plural, this is actually very good English for a Japanese game, and it probably was like this even in the Japanese version. The Foundation's activities centred around the following three guiding principles. 1. Carrying out fundamental research on orbments. 2. Spreading orbital technology and informing the public of its benefits. 3. Contributing to world peace through technology. Now then, let's discuss each of these three guiding principles in more depth. Yeah, this is basically a lecture. 1. Carrying out fundamental research on orbments. The Foundation's most important mission is, naturally, the improvement and development of orbital technology. The fundamental principles behind how orbments work need no improvements as such, but their architectures, their internal structures, have been improved upon countless times in the past and will surely continue to be perfected by the curious mind as the years go on. One day they might even be able to literally turn the power of friendship into magic. Orbman's architecture concerns the mechanical parts inside them, such as the cogs and the screws, and there is still plenty of room for change as this new technology develops. These improvements can reap great rewards, but the research necessary to make them is known to be as lengthy as it is expensive. As a result, companies who prioritise profit over all else are less inclined to pursue them. That makes our Foundation's research all the more important from a social perspective. 2. Spreading orbital technology and informing the public of its benefits. Two other important goals of the Foundation are to spread orbital technology as widely as possible and to educate the public on the correct way to use it. While orbments have become part of the daily lives of most who live in advanced nations and populated urban areas, the reality in remote and mountainous regions is very different. To counter this, we have long worked to send missions of engineers and bracers to those regions to try and better the standard of living for those people, and will continue to do so. We also continue to work on other ways to spread awareness of orbital technology, such as working closer with the Septian Church to have it added to the curriculum of Sunday school classes. Uh, yes, like, science and religion actually work together in this world. 3. Contributing to world peace through technology. It is to pursue this noble yet extremely difficult goal that the Foundation has had a close relationship with the Bracer Guild ever since its initial founding. The Guild was established as an international peacekeeping organisation and can mediate on conflicts between nations from a neutral point of view, making it essential to the stability of the world as it stands. The Epstein Foundation continues to back them up fully in their cause, both with financial aid and using the fact that Lehman State is the only place where tentacle augments are produced to provide them with equipment. Just as well, this relationship provides ideal feedback towards tweaking the quality of tactical augments as they are used in combat too. Every machine and every invention goes through a long, grueling process behind the scenes before eventually reaching its finished, refined form, and tactical augments are no exception. Then, in S1190, our Foundation unveiled the Orbal Network Project, which will be implemented in partnership with the ZCF. Said project aims to join all of Zamuria together with a single unified communications network, but our hope is it will do much more than that. Our hope is that it will help to realise a peaceful world through communication. Sadly, Orbman's relationship with peace as a concept has become somewhat complicated. Are they aiding in its realisation, or are they doing the exact opposites? Professor Epstein expressed his hopes that their ability to realise the limitless looping of energy would be able to bring lasting peace to the world. Instead, recent years have thoroughly betrayed those hopes, and the post-revolution world has become a chaotic one indeed. The conflict between Laburl and Erebonia, for one, made significant use of orbital weaponry, airships included. It seems beyond a doubt that orbital weaponry will continue to become more and more advanced, making war an even more tragic event than ever. 
could even be something that uh, causes the destruction of the world, like a serpent eating it. In the face of all this, how should we go about trying to create a peaceful world? We believe the best way to do this is to rely on the power of communication, and a means to do so with people of different nationalities and races. If these people can be more can more easily interact and more easily deepen their understanding of one another, perhaps that will allow us to create the world we all so dearly desire. Or it could create a world of uh, massive amounts of trolling and um, things like that. In the end, one thing is for certain: our challenges to try and realize Professor Epstein's ideals are only just beginning. So yeah, that's that entire door. And with that, we get a pretty good quartz, Ingenuity 2, which fits for a door that talks about science and invention. I believe the Ingenuity Quartz is literally called Machine Power in Japanese. So definitely, uh, like, a reference there. So Ingenuity is pretty cool, though you probably want it on a caster. And this is why I also said this is where we kind of want level 3 slots, because we're going to start to get some very, very strong level 3 quartz from doors. So yes, um... It's got quite a lot of elemental value to it, a good amount of fire along with time and water, recovers a small amount of EP while walking and in battle. So you get in battle EP regeneration, which again, great for casters. Uh, I guess I can put that on Chloe right now. Like, EP3 is not really raising your EP that much. Her current EP is already kind of overkill anyway. And that gives her better access to these things. Like, with a little bit of effort, she could be able to get Cyclone Napalm, or I could just, you know, give her, um, uh, give her the Ruby Gem. But anyway. So, that was. That door was pretty cool. It's mostly just world building, but I, I love the way that the trail series does world building, and it is actually making me start to miss it, because later games have such complicated storylines that they've kind of forgotten a lot of the world building like foundation that they had in the beginning. And I like the way that this series does it, because um, I recently, uh, like last year, played uh, a game called Tearing Saga, which I felt was a perfect example of how to do world building wrong. In that game, characters are constantly dumping pages and pages of exposition on you, forced during the main storyline. It's really clunky and awkward. Anyway, like, you can watch my playthrough of Tearing Sarko if you want to see that, but, like, it's definitely a big flaw of that game. It's not great when it comes to dumping its world building on you. Games like this and Fire Emblem Three Houses, I think, are examples of how to do world building well. They keep most of the world building to optional conversations and side elements. Things like books that you can read, or in this case, like, a flashback door. This wasn't even really a flashback. And I think that means, like, you can learn about the world at your own pace, and at the same time, it doesn't get in your way if you're just here for the main storyline and don't want to just read pages and pages of lore. The other thing, though, about that door that I think is very, very interesting is you might have noticed me drawing attention to the pronouns of one of the three disciples there. And that's because that, for the longest time, this door called Professor Hamilton a he. It wasn't until Kuro no Kiseki, released in 2021, that we found out that Professor Hamilton was in fact a woman. And what happened after that game released is that Exceed, this game came out in English, localized by Exceed in 2017. In 2021, Exceed went back and patched this game to change Hamilton's pronouns to she. That right there shows dedication to preserving the integrity of this world and the world building. I just think they deserve so much praise for that. So many game companies would just go, eh, yeah, it's fine. This was a localization that we did before we knew that, so we're not going to go ahead and change it. It's, it's also kind of just a, a great benefit of, like, patches these days, and in particular PC games. You have the ability to go back and do this. And I just, I'm just blown away that this was actually able to happen. Like, it might not sound like much to people who aren't as invested in the series as I am, but I just think that, like, I think XC deserves so much praise for the fact that they even did that. 
But in terms of other stuff, I love just how grounded a lot of the technological advancement in this world is. Like, they're working on what's essentially the internet right now uh, in this fantasy world. They talk about bringing technology to more developing nations and helping to spread that. They talk about the societal benefits they want to bring about through technology. They also talk about, you know, refining on the designs and things like, like, augments, augments get more and more refined in later games. I can even show, like, an, an augment here. Uh, in later games in the series, they, they get in, uh, upgraded versions. I alluded to one of them, the Arcus. I mean, in general, I've never really seen a fantasy setting like the Trails one, because it combines a fantasy world with magic, monsters, uh, you know, dragons, uh, like, myths and gods, with a lot of modern day technological uh, aspects as well, like ideas of an industrial revolution, na nations invading others for resources to make more technology, technology proving to be the tipping point in wars, people trying to bring technology to developing nations. It just allows the Trail series to cover a, such a broad range of themes that are really relevant to a lot of things even today, and yeah, it's just one of the reasons why I like this series so much. So, that's all that I had to say about that door, uh, this will probably have been a much shorter video. Next time, we will be heading out to release the next Ceiling Stone, and explore the next part of the Labyrinth. See you all then.